Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed we do. We got Logan back in house to give us the latest update on his model and also some new polling developments, both with regards to the presidential race in Pennsylvania specifically and with regard to Senate races. Texas may be more interesting than people previously thought, so we'll take a look at all of that. Um, also, Kamala Harris yesterday announcing her policy plan for black men, and it is really something. Um, apparently, I don't know. Well, we'll just yeah. save all of my commentary on that yeah. for that. It involves weed. Block. Yeah, it involves, involves weed and involves crypto weed. and male mentors yeah, and is the most neoliberal thing I've literally ever seen. So we'll dig into that. Um, also, might be going on Joe Rogan, Kamala Harris. Certainly possible. Yesterday it's we possible. covered that fun. Trump may be going on with Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. And today, so we felt the need to get this into the show today, yeah. but apparently her people are in talks, so... That would be interesting. I'm hoping. I think it'd be fun. Clearly, we're trying to make a pitch for the male vote, yep. bro vote, um, with all this crypto and Rogan doings. So uh, we'll dig into that. We also, Trump making some truly wild comments um, that we wanted to make sure and cover and what that could pretend in terms of election day and a future Trump uh, possible administration. We're also going to take a look at this supposed third assassination attempt on Trump, which appears to be nothing of the sort. Um, we'll bring you all of the details there. We also wanted to uh, take some time out to take a look at the real estate market in Florida. You know, Florida experienced this massive during COVID and post COVID boom. Um, many people moving to the state, you know, uh, Ron DeSantis and other politicians really, really bragging about that, very proud of that. Some of that may be reversing now. So we're gonna dig into the real estate market there, especially exacerbated now by the, the state being hit by two very severe hurricanes. Um, we've got some, uh, once again, horrific updates for you out of Israel as well, including a New York Times report about how Israel has been systematically using Palestinians as human shields, well-documented, um, sourced actually to the soldiers themselves who are engaged in this practice. So we'll break all of that down for you as well. That's right. Before we get to any of that, uh, make sure you go ahead and subscribe, breakingpoints.com. You get access to our exclusive election content, including one of our segments today with Logan. So if you want to be able to watch that and everything, the show, Uncut, AMAs, you can take advantage, breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber. Let's get to Logan. Joining us now, Logan Phillips, our exclusive election forecaster. Logan, we love seeing you here at the desk. Welcome back, man. Hey, love to be here. Awesome. All right, let's dig into it. You've got your uh, forecast race to the White House. Let's go ahead and put that up there on the screen. We've only got 20 days until the presidential election. You currently have it, actually, it's narrowed a little bit since we talked last time. You have it 55, 45 for Kamala Harris. Effectively, in my head, that's like a toss up, right? You know, with only 5% margin or so. So talk to us about some of the movement within that, why things have maybe tightened with a little bit let, with less time to go now before the raid. Yeah, there's two reasons. Donald Trump's yeah. gained a little bit in the national polls. Um, mm -hmm. We seem to, seem to see more movement in the national polls than we do in some of these swing states. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but, you know, Harris's lead has crept a little bit under 3% nationally. Mm -hmm. and the other thing is we had a rush of polls showing Trump ahead in Michigan and Wisconsin. Now, right. some of these were lower quality polls, but there were enough of them that they, at least for me, and I think for everyone else, they kind of pulled it a little closer. So mm -hmm. um, whether that's true or not, we're going to get a better sense in the next few days, but it's certainly a canary in the coal mine for Harris. Got it. All right, well, let's, oh, sorry, go ahead, Crystal. Um, yeah. You, uh, you got it. All right, well, let's continue. <laughs> let's continue then on the Electoral College because this is where, what you were just talking about with the swing states, this stuff really matters. So A2, please, if we can put that up on the screen. Here you have uh, in the overall seven key swing states, you actually have Trump up by 0.5 there in the state of Pennsylvania, arguably the most important one. Mm. Wisconsin, though, you have Harris up by one. In Nevada, I want to come back to this because you have Harris up by 1.6. It's a little bit different than what I've seen elsewhere. Trump up in North Carolina, and then you also have Wisconsin uh, pretty well close there. So maybe explain a little bit of where things are here in the forecast. Also, I misspoke. I apologize. Pennsylvania, you have Harris up by 1.3. Just explain a little bit here this margin, uh, some of the movement again that we've seen here, and uh, your theory of whether they'll all move together or they won't. Mm. Yeah, to some degree, yeah. they definitely will move together, but it's quite, there still can be that gap. And if the election is as close as the polls suggest and there isn't a big polling miss, you could absolutely see division, right? Mm -hmm. But if either candidate overperforms even by like one and a half points, they could sweep all of them potentially. Yeah. Um, and I, I think there's something really interesting going on, right? Because like for the last, honestly, like at least since 2012, we've seen Midwestern states that are a little bit more white, like shift 
uh, very, very fast towards yeah. Republicans. Yeah. yeah. And Democrats start to zoom forward in the Sun Belt so fast that states like Georgia that weren't even close to in play, you know, are going for them if they win the popular vote by enough. Mm -hmm. But this year, it seems like the brakes have been stopped on both of those trends and maybe even reversed. And I'm wondering if that has something to do with the strategic objectives of both parties. The iceberg for the GOP is their low performance with non-white voters that will kill them as the country becomes majority minority. Mm -hmm. And for Democrats, the short-term iceberg, the one that almost cost them in 2020 and did cost them the election in 16, is their poor performance with white voters. And so perhaps this is both parties achieving their goals to some degree, which has caused the map to kind of shift a little bit in the other direction, where Democrats are doing better than they did in the Midwest last time relative to the national vote, and actually maybe even worse in right. Georgia and Arizona. Yeah, so sticking with that point, you're specifically talking about Democratic gains with white voters, probably white college-educated voters, and then Trump and de Republican performance with black and Latino voters, yes. specifically men, which we're about to get to in a little bit. Yeah, 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 and, and we'll see how much it uh, goes in reality. I mean, there's a constant trend of polls underrating Democratic support of black voters. Mm -hmm. And you know, New York Times, Nate Cohen went into this um, recently as one of the possibilities, right? Is that some of the um, supporters that, or some black voters that say they're gonna support Republicans don't often vote necessarily, or they're mm. low propensity voters. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it hasn't always shown up. Part of that's due to habits. Some of that is due to the GOT efforts um, in the black community, you're often targeted more towards Democratic groups, right? True. right? And Republicans haven't really put much effort or resources in. They're True. just starting to, but they're not going to catch up in one cycle. Yeah, yeah. we're going to cover in the next block some on the uh, Kamala Harris's effort to reach men in general, black men specifically. And I've had the same question in my mind because back in 2020, there were also a lot of polls that showed like, oh, Joe Biden might underperform with black men. But then when it came to election day, he had the same performance as Democrats typically have. So I think that's that's a big question mark. We wanted you to dig into a little bit of uh, Pennsylvania because I imagine your assessment is the same as ours, same as a lot of other people that mm -hmm. Pennsylvania may be effectively the whole ball game. Um, there's some interesting early, early voting data that I wanted you to take a look at and tell us what, if anything, we should make of it. Uh, Tom Bonnier, who's with Target Smart, which is a Democratic aligned firm, but you know, I mean, their, their data is just Data and he's data, yeah. taking a look at it. So let's put this thread up on the screen. Let me show you a few pieces of this. So he says, if you look at the vote report in Pennsylvania so far, Democrats have a solid advantage in terms of party registration, though the gap is smaller than it was in 2020 at the same point. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Go ahead to the next one here. We can take a look. He says, let's look at the early vote by modeled partisanship. So not just what people self-identify, but what their target smart modeling suggests their vote will be. It shows a wider Dem lead than at this point in 2020. Why is that? The answer is simple. The model believes that the unaffiliated voters are more Democratic than they were in 2020. If we could go to the next one as well, he's been pointing out that there appears to have been in multiple states a huge surge in black women uh, registering to vote and so far also turning out to vote. He says, looking at the racial breakdown of women, early voters in PA, we see the biggest increases among women of color, especially black women whose turnout is 248% of their turnout at this point in 2020 compared to 146% for white women, so women in general, turning out at higher rates than they do in 2020. What, if anything, do you make of these numbers? How should we think about these things? Yeah, I don't know if it can tell us too much about who's going to win, because it's so hard to interpret early vote accurately, mm -hmm. especially given yeah. how much the electorate is changing with their early voting habits post-COVID. Um, that being said, it does tell us the story of what the parties are trying to do and whether they're being successful. Republicans were trying really hard to reverse some of the fears about early voting and voting by mail. And this, this suggests maybe they've made some ground on that front. Yep. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to win the election. Some of these guys would have voted on election day. But it's a lot easier when you have a GOTV operation to get people to vote early um, because you don't have to then worry about them in the final stretch and you can focus your resources You can kind of check, check them off yeah, check and them focus off. on the people who you're still working to persuade to turn out. Exactly. And then on the Democratic front, right, as we're just talking about the fear is, are they going to have the same level of turnout with black voters? Um, especially in Philadelphia and Milwaukee. And so we're seeing some good signs in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin on that front for Dems. Um, and, you know, turnout was high across the board. It was a little lower in some of these cities in 2020 mm -hmm. relative to the rest of the state. Uh, but Democrats managed to win anyway. And, you know, they're hoping that that doesn't happen in 2024. And this is a sign that their plan to change this is working. And, you know, the Harris campaign, everyone says, has a pretty great GOTV operation. I think mm. um, there's a question mark on Trump's because he has had his super PACs take the lead on that. They're using some new strategies and it could work out. It could also kind of blow up in their face. And a lot of GOP operatives are worried about that. I've seen that. 
Now, well, Elon is a big part of the turnout operation in Pennsylvania, is yeah, it not? Yeah, it's the America Pack. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes. So sometimes innovation in politics is very important and can work. And Elon himself is kind of interesting because the guy either kills it or it fails. That's a good way True. of putting it. That's a very good way of putting it. Uh, can we put the New York Times poll up on the screen? I want to talk to you about this. A4, please. Uh, mystery repeats. Harris up by four in PA, according to the New York Times. Trump up by six in Arizona. So there was a previous theory that all seven swing states would either go one way or the other way, kind of how they did in 2020. Mm -hmm. This time, like you just said, we see a bit of a reversal in that trend as both of the parties are fighting to accomplish the two things that cost them previous elections. Elections. Is that what you see going on here? Uh, what are the key characteristics of why and how there could be a 10-point spread between these two critical swing states? So I think it's unlikely it's that big, but it's yeah. possible, right? It's, it's probably the biggest spread pollsters had, yeah. or at least any I can think of off the cuff. Mm -hmm. um, but the New York Times theory of the case, and they're smart, so maybe they're right, yeah. um, is that Democrats are genuinely doing better with white voters, especially white college-educated voters. And that is enabling them to do better in the Midwest, but they are losing ground with non-white voters and therefore underperforming in the Sun Belt. So right. they see the national vote being worse for Democrats and a lot closer than everyone else is showing right now. Mm -hmm. Um, and they show, but they still have Democrats winning through that Midwest path. Yeah. And Fairly. that would be a 2022 scenario, right? Because yeah. that's what we talked a lot about yesterday, two times polls budding on this political realignment. Um, in this scenario, would you expect Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada to all move similarly? Because I saw it in your forecast, you have Nevada, Harris up, but you know I've seen Trump up there almost by six points in some places, which is a crazy reversal. When's the last time Republicans won I, I want to say 2004. Like, yes, yeah, it's been a long time. I saw the same yeah. poll, and I think yeah. the one was an outlier. I'd be shocked right. if you won. I wouldn't be shocked if you won Nevada, but yeah. I'd be shocked if you won by six. Um, I think that Nevada is probably a little easier for Dems than maybe even the other three hmm. Midwest states okay. based off the current polling, but it's a hard state to poll. And the GOP, it's been their white whale, and it's not because True. it's an uncatchable one. They're barely losing yeah, it. Yeah, every time. It's like this close. So they could win it. I yeah. mean, in 2014, they just, Democrats went completely AWOL in the state and GOP won the House seats by a combined 18%. I think they won the governor race by 40. Yeah. So like, there's the, you can't rule out Nevada. There's a reason it's on the swing state list. Yeah, I mean, it's such a unique state demographically and also just with the union density and the nature of the, I mean, the culinary workers union and how much the service sector dominates. So it's not like, you know, hard hat construction unions, which have really shifted towards Trump. Um, it's the service sector unions, which have stayed more in the democratic camp. But, you know, still you have a state where there was hit very hard by COVID, where economic concerns are really paramount, where the demographics may not at this point in time particularly favor Democrats in terms of, um, you know, the, some of the realignments and some of the shifts. But, you know, to go back to your point about if the New York Times theory is correct about the, the shifts in the electorate, if, if Kamala Harris wins those quote unquote blue wall states, but loses all the other ones, she wins 270 to 268. Like, I mean, right? Am I doing that math right? Yeah, it's you're just doing as, the math right. As close as it could effectively That's possibly with, with, be. Uh, with Nebraska. With Nebraska. Which kind of terrifies me, just yeah. given the way that the post-election last time went with all the conspiracy yeah. theories and all of the, and January 6th and all of the chaos. Like, if it is that razor thin, I think we're in for, I won't ask you to opine on that piece, but I think we're in for some very troubled times mm -hmm. post-election day if it is truly that narrow of a margin. I don't know what you're talking about, Chris, so I think everyone in the country will handle that very peacefully and pleasantly. <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone's going to yeah. be like, okay, we're so great. Yeah. We we'll congratulate our new right. presidential victor. We'll all move forward. Um, I wanted to add, I did want you to have pine, though, on um, this phenomenon of quote unquote trash polls and whether you think there's a real thing, we could put the real clear politics average up here. Uh, these are all of the pencil, recent Pennsylvania polls and many of them are favoring Trump, but also many of them are um, partisan polls. A few of them are you know, ones that I think you could you could classify in that junk poll or trash poll status. So um, talk to us about the, the rise of some of these new pollsters and how we should be thinking about that in terms of these, these states and these numbers. Yeah, well, you know, I don't usually like to talk about this to my fellow, you know, pollster, poll averagers yeah. out there. But RCB does have a bit of a tendency to include some of the GOP internal polls and manage to take off some of the high quality polls that might show the Democrats ahead sometimes. Right. So yeah. it might be a little skewed. I think there is some concerns, especially with Rasmussen, um, Trafalgar. You know, Rasmussen mm -hmm. in particular, they had a poll a year ago that they put out that they said proved that Dr. Fauci had killed more people than anyone since the Holocaust. And so. <laughs> 
Uh, there's 538 bend them. It's not I bend exactly them. like straight shooting mm. with that. I don't bend almost anyone, right? Like mm. I might lower the rating, but like it's a high standard for me. But Rasmussen mm -hmm. has kind of met that and vaulted over it. So right. some of these I, are a little less reputable than others. Okay. Well, my, my question though is, and the reason why I'm focusing on it is that this was such a key part of the 2022 story uh, is that if you had, and I, I put this out like a couple of days ago, and one of the common responses I got is, look, you know, even by Republicans, they're like, look, liberals are not wrong, that there were a lot of crappy stuff in the overall polling averages leading up to 2022, which led to a false picture, where if you scroll down and you look at Marist, New York Times, Siena, they all mostly had Fetterman up by a couple of points, and they were right, right? Yeah. And so uh, if we want to, for the viewer out there who doesn't just, want, who wants to look for themselves and try and figure this out, not necessarily rely on a weighting measure, how should they think about it? Like, how do you think about it when you're rating different people? Is it just accuracy? Is it, uh, you know, like samples? Just talk to us about that, because I think we have an audience that really wants to get in the weeds here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think accuracy is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, does it, just because you got it right one cycle doesn't mean you get it right the next mm -hmm. cycle, right? And a lot of these pollsters have a tendency to miss a little to the left, a little to the right. Um, and it makes it harder. Sometimes they change their approach. Emerson used to miss to the left. Now they appear to be to the right of most pollsters. Oh, they change their strategy. Yeah. So that makes it a little harder. I would say Are the they overall, one of the ones that's shifted to the self-identification of like, you know, how you voted last time? I believe that Emerson uses that, but I'm not 100% mm. okay. sure. Yeah. Um, they definitely include that in all of their polls. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. And, and that's also, that's a really good point, right? Like that's the gamble pollsters, some pollsters are taking. Some of like the... Maybe they're not like New York Times or Marist, like the top ones, but ones that are still reputable. It's sort of like a shortcut. They're saying, okay, if the electorate's like, exactly like 2020, how are these voters going to vote? Mm -hmm. But we know for a fact the electorate's not going to be like 2020. Yeah. Right. Because that was the highest turnout election in American history, If we, unless we go back before women had the right to vote. Right? <laughs> and we, which I don't think we should. Well, so. you said previously, you talked about how you think turnout will be a little bit less this time around. Probably. So where do you think things will be around 2016, 2020? Like, what are our benchmarks here? Uh, you're making it harder for me. It's a lot easier yeah. to be right if I just think less than the highest yeah, turnout yeah. Yeah. ever. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really know to answer that question. That's such a hard one to estimate. Mm -hmm. um, and... That is why pollster's job is so hard, uh, because you have to get a sample of the electorate with people who aren't responding to phone calls as much to get an idea of both how likely they are to vote and who are they going to vote for instead. Yep. Honestly, the best approach are ones like Selzer uses in Iowa, mm. where you just call people on voter registration files and you ask, you figure out how likely they are to vote by asking them some questions, and then you mm. can project turnout. Um, but even then, you get that's part of why polls are a lot more accurate at the last second, because it's not just that people change their mind, it's that people might commit to voting or not voting. Yes, mm. yeah, that's such a key point. Yeah, right. that is a great point. Um, all right, let's go ahead and move on yes. to the uh, Senate forecast. And um, for those of you who are premium subscribers, we're gonna have this posted early exclusively for you. We're gonna have it posted later in the week for all, but if you wanna get this heads up, straight from Logan, as soon as possible, which we know you all do, yes. go ahead and subscribe, breakingpoints.com. All right, um, let's go ahead and put- Hey, um, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show, ad-free and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right, get the full show, help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.